Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to my channel. Now, today I'm coming at you guys with a crazy video. But before we get started, please make sure to give it a big like and subscribe. Now, the video that I'm about to be speaking on, right, the incident, right, uh, it's it pertains to a vato from Mexico, right? He ended up coming over here to California, settling in California, and he ended up becoming known as a prolific serial. I can't say the word because I'll get demonetized, right? But he ended up getting convicted of something like 25 hot ones, right? Uh, but before we get started, we need to go back to the beginning, right? Now, this individual was uh, diagnosed uh, later on in his life, right, as a paranoia, a schizophrenic, right? So how did this gentleman, right, end up getting convicted of some gruesome crimes? Let's take it back to the, the very beginning, right? Juan Corona, was, who's the individual, right? was born in February of 1934. Uh, he was one of 10 children, you know, born to his parents. But his father actually had three other children from his first marriage. Uh, the oldest being, you know, his half-sibling, Corona's half-sibling, right, Natividad. Now, Natividad ended up, you know, migrating to California in 1944 in hopes of finding work, since he knew a lot of the people uh, in the United States had been drafted, right? for World War II, so he figured he'd try his chances and find work over here. So uh, Corona, right, in 1950, when he was 16 years old, he ended up dropping out of high school, and he ended up moving uh, over here to California. He ended up working in, you know, the Imperial and Sacramento Valley, right? And he would attend night classes in the, in the night, right, so that he would, you know, be, be able to speak fluent English. In 1953, he ended up moving to the Marysville, uh, Yuba uh, County metropolitan area, right? And that's where he ended up settling because his brother, you know, he, he told him to move to that area, right? So he ended up going. Uh, he shortly married, you know, a Sacramento native. Uh, the marriage didn't last long within, uh, what, a few, a few uh, three months, I believe it was. They ended up divorcing. And in December of 1955, there was a, a flood that occurred, right? I believe it was like the Yuba and Feather River, somewhere in that location, right? It got flooded and it flooded most of, you know, the Sacramento Valley. As a matter of fact, something like 38 people, you know, drowned, right? They, they, or they passed away. Uh, now, this incident right here ended up affecting Corona severely. He ended up pretty much tripping out on that, bro. He wasn't able to recover from that. Uh, this happened, like I said, in December of 1955. Uh, the I guess he started saying that he believed that everyone perished in that flood and that every everybody he was seeing were ghosts. So his brother, uh, he ended up obviously suffering a mental breakdown. So his brother, uh, the following month, on January of 1956, Natividad, had him committed, right, to a mental health hospital where he underwent 23 electroshock therapy treatments in the course of three months. He was considered, you know what I mean, cured, and he was released, right, and he ended up being deported back to Mexico. He ended up coming back legally that same year, right, uh, back to California. And I believe it was uh, 19, 1959 that he ended up uh, marrying his second wife. He ended up having four daughters with her, right? And in 1962, he says he was a good worker. He ended up becoming a, a licensed contractor, right? So he would hire out, you know, individuals to and to work on certain farms, right? Uh, but in 1970, he ended up suffering, you know, uh, another kind of a, a mental breakdown, right? He ended up being institutionalized again for a little bit, right? Uh that uh, May, right, of 1970, uh, a patron, right, uh, somebody that was, you know, at the cafe where his brother worked at, right, or where his brother owned, uh, it was a cafe, Natividad owned it, right, a Mexican ended up being attacked in the restroom. Uh, he was hit with the machete in the face and in the head, and he was almost scalped. So the dude, he didn't pass away, but he he wasn't able to identify who did it because he didn't see who did it. But Corona was, you know, suspected of possibly being, you know what I mean, a culprit because he was one of the dudes that was in the cafe at the time. 
since the dude didn't know who did it, right, he ended up uh, suing Natividad since it was, you know what I mean, his cafe. He ended up uh, winning $250,000, right? But Natividad, before any of that, right, he just sold his properties and did back to Mexico. In 1971, a farmer, um, I believe it was in Sutter Creek uh, County, uh, he was in his farm, it was an orchard, and I guess he ended up seeing a, a, a hole, right, a freshly dug hole in his orchard. So he asked his workers, like, yo, a lot of them, or all of them who were hired through, you know what I mean, at least Corona's contacts, uh, he asked them, like, yo, who dug this hole? None of them knew. Later on that night, uh, the farmer went back to the hole, and it was already patched up, right? It was already filled in. So he called the cops, right? And they ended up finding the body of a drifter. Uh, they found them, right? A lot of the people, or I think all of the people that were found, right, that were deceased, they were all drifters, right? Kind of, they were just going from farm to farm and just migrants, you know what I mean? They were kind of just like winos, just going from farm to farm, just, you know what I mean? Drifters, just like that, right? Getting jobs from here, this farm to this farm, just roaming like that. A few days later, uh, they ended up uh, in an adjoining orchard, right? Uh, some fools were using a tractor. They came across another, you know what I mean, freshly dug hole. And they called the cops. They found another body. Then they found another body, right? So they kept finding bodies. And in these graves, right? And some of those graves, it would be like meat market tickets, which it would have this fool's uh, name, right? or he had signed off on them in Corona. And a lot of people started saying that they had seen these individuals had been asking Corona for a job, right? Or riding around in his truck. And a truck, you know, similar to one that Corona drives, it would be seen in the area. So that raised red flags automatically. Uh, but the sheriffs didn't wanna, you know what I mean, hit them yet, because they wanted to see how many bodies, you know what I mean, were how many, you know, hard ones, you know what I mean, he had committed. So they end up raiding this was pad, right? They raid this was pad. They end up finding a 18-inch machete, a bloody club, uh, I believe a gun, ammunition, because one of the victims, most of them had been, you know what I mean, sliced or stabbed or stuff like that, but one of them had been, you know what I mean, lit up. So they end up finding ammunition, machete, bloody club, uh, Oh, and a notepad, right, with 34 individuals' names on it and dates. And they end up finding his car, I believe, they have, they found blood. So they end up uh, getting an aero, aero, aircraft, right, to get aerial um, infrared photos of the area. Well, when it was all said and done, right, uh, they end up finding like 25, something like 25 bodies. So this fool was obviously charged, right, with all these hot ones, 25 of them to be exact. And uh, he ended up getting appointed, you know what I mean, a public attorney whom he was going to, he was already had uh, hired, you know, a psychiatrist and whatnot. So he was going to try to play that, you know what I mean, uh, not guilty by reasons of insanity or stuff like that. But he ended up getting a private attorney. And this private attorney, he he fired all the psychiatrists, all that. He didn't even bother, you know what I mean, pleading innocent, you know what I mean, because of insanity or stuff like that. He didn't even bother, right? Uh, this dude was on a trip, this attorney. Uh, yeah, he, he literally did nothing, you know what I mean? He didn't bring up his mental health issues in the past, nothing. Like, he literally didn't even try. Come to find out later, it was discovered that he was only working because, I guess, he had agreed as payment, I guess, he was going to own the life rights uh, and his story, right, of Corona. And that's why he took on the deal. Obviously, this fool ends up getting convicted, right, just with an attorney like that. He wasn't even, he was just trying to get it over with and just probably make a movie or a book deal, you know what I mean? So he ends up getting convicted in 1973, January, uh, to 25 consecutive life terms, right? Uh, the following year, his wife, you know, divorced him. Uh, and when this fool, right, a short time after he had got convicted, he actually ended up getting stabbed up in prison uh, in the face area. He ended up losing vision of his right eye. 
1978, he was granted another trial, right? Because, uh, well, obviously his first attorney was compromised. So he got a second attorney. Now this attorney, he tried to play his cards, you know what I mean? Slip. Now he tried to blame the whole hot ones on Natividad, Corona's brother. He stated how the first incident, right, with the fool that got hurt, right, that he didn't pass away, that that happened in Natividad's cafe, right, and that that's why he fled and that he was a crazy uh, homosexual. But Corona had admitted that prior to him coming to the United States, he had had a homosexual encounter, right? And uh, Natividad, he had already passed away since then, right? He had already passed away in 1973 in Mexico. Uh, that didn't work regardless. This boy ended up getting washed up, right? He ended up getting sentenced to life regardless, even in his new trial. Uh, ultimately, uh, Natividad, he ended up passing away, I believe it was in March of 2019 at the age of 85 in Corcoran. And uh, he died because of natural causes, right? But tell me what do you guys think about this, right? It's a trip. A lot of these individuals would be found with like their pants down right um i do not know what what was his problem right or he was tripping or like they said he was paranoia right schizophrenic uh he do you guys think he was already all messed up or do you guys think that that pushed him over the edge and he lost his mind and he started doing all kinds of crazy stuff nonetheless right at one point he was the most prolific serial uh in america right in the united states and they believe that he he had much more uh, victims, right, than that. They were only able to find five, 25 um, bodies. But like they said, in the blue, they believe that in the, in the notepad that they found, right, at his crib, which it had the names of individuals and dates, they believe that those, uh, that he would either write them out before the, the where he, he would commit the crimes or after he would commit the crimes. But nonetheless, it was 34 names, right? And there was only 25 bodies found. Four of those were never even identified. Uh, it's a trip, guys. But comment down below, and I hope you guys are able to sleep well tonight. But other than that, guys, I'm out. Peace.